Welcome to Talk With History. I'm your host, Scott, here with my wife and historian, Jen. Hello. Today's podcast is part of our series we are calling Watch With History. The Watch With History series will focus on your favorite historical films where Jen and I will review the Hollywood historic classics we all know and love, while also discussing the history behind these films along with some interesting facts. We hope you enjoy Watch With History. Three, two, one. Here we go! Now, real quick, before we get into our main topic, I just want to give a shout out to VA Jam over, they gave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. That's awesome. So I really appreciate that. The title of the five-star review is Bedford Boys. I was incredibly moved by this episode. Thank you for sharing. We have received a lot of really great feedback on that episode. If you're watching this and you're curious, the Bedford Boys, we talk about the National World War II monument monument in Bedford, Virginia that we got to visit. It's an amazing, it's probably one of the best episodes that I've done for the podcast. Um, and I, I've re- received some incredible feedback on that. It's a very good sister episode to this since we're Absolutely. talking about World War II today. I'll link it in the show notes. Uh, Bedford Boys is about D-Day and it's about per capita. Bedford, Virginia took the highest loss of life than any other city or town in the United States of America. That's right. So again, thank you for the feedback. Uh, we've, we're getting more s- stars, I guess, on Spotify. They don't do reviews. We've got seven five-star re- reviews over on Spotify. So if you're listening, thank you so much. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, five-star reviews, positive or negative. We will read them. And, uh, and also kind of give us a, drop us some stars on Spotify as well. Today's episode is for the history buffs and the aviation enthusiasts because we're taking off on a deep dive into the skies of World War II. We're zeroing in on the Apple TV Plus miniseries Masters of the Air, a show that's captivated audiences with its portrayal of the 8th Air Force's B-17 bomber crews. But how close does Masters of the Air actually fly to the historical realities of those missions? And more importantly, what is it really like to be strapped into one of those metal beasts hurtling towards flak-filled German skies? Now, as a naval aviator, Jen spent countless hours in cockpits facing down G-forces and the ever-present threat of that pesky thing called gravity. But I'm sure nothing compares to the pressure cooker of a B-17 on a daylight raid over Nazi Germany. These young Americans, barely out of their teens, faced unimaginable dangers, icy temperatures, oxygen deprivation, and the constant dance with death that came from German fighters and anti-aircraft fire. So in this episode, we're going to pull back the curtain on Masters of the Air. We'll separate the Hollywood heroics from the gut-wrenching reality by examining the decisions the characters make in the heat of the moment and why they do what they do. From the bombardier's agonizing choices to the pilot's split-second reactions, we'll explore the psychology and the tactics that keep these planes and their crews in the air, mission after mission. So strap yourselves in, folks. We're about to take off on a journey through history, a flight into the heart of what it meant to be a master of the air. All right, Jen. (laughs) Here, here we are talking about Masters of the Air. Uh, I'm so excited to do this episode. I'm so honored to do this episode and to talk about this because uh, we always, we laugh about it because the running joke is, how do you know who the pilots are in the room? Don't worry, they'll tell you. That's right. And I, Scott says, I always seem to work into a conversation that I'm a pilot. I always seem to work it in somehow. And if you're a pilot, you understand that. You've worked really hard You've mastered an aircraft, you've mastered something, you've gotten your wings. It's it's accomplishment that you're really proud of. And I always say there's two egotistical people you want in your life, your surgeon and your pilot. That's right. So this is where we start to see uh, in, in this episode, I really appreciate those kind of characteristics, those types of characters, those types of people. And there are people on here who who we surprisingly don't know that I'm a pilot. So yeah, she wears a hat with little aviator wings on it. She wears a flight jacket in multiple videos. Yes. But it, for for those who who aren't familiar with this, is the first time you're seeing one of our our episodes. 
you know, so Jen was a naval aviator. She flew in the Navy for about seven years. She got the chance to fly all sorts of different aircraft. I mean, even as a midshipman, she got to fly in an F-14. F-14. So she flew T-34s, which is- three, you know, all, 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 all those aircraft, mm-hmm. she, got, she got to fly. Now, her primary aircraft was a helicopter. A helicopter. Black Hawk, Paint Silver, yeah. Seahawk. So. so, But she flew combat missions right after 9-11. I mean, she's legit. <laughs> and so I, I like to kind of put that out there mm-hmm. and me put that out there so that people kind of understand- where we're going in this podcast, because not only are we going to talk about the show, some of its historical kind of accuracies, but you're also going to talk about kind of the mindset of pilots that fly into combat Mm -hmm. and kind of why, especially in these first couple episodes, they're doing what they're doing. Yes. And I like to stress, too, that I, I was winged 20 something years ago. So my call sign was Yoko. I broke up the band, one of the first females. So proving yourself a lot as a woman. But first in my class out of flight school and always rated one of the best pilots in the squadron. And I had great camaraderie with all the guys I flew with because you will see, just like in Masters of the Air, personalities can be very different. But when you start to build the trust that you're good at your job, then that love comes shining through and it really doesn't matter. When you're in the cockpit, it's you two and your crew and you've got each other and you're in this together. And so that really is the camaraderie you feel as a pilot. So that's what I think they're really trying to show in the first couple episodes is these hodgepodge crews, these hodgepodge people coming from all around the U.S. And they stress that with the dots on the map that these men are coming from all different areas. So there's very different personalities. And they're showing these two really good characters who are going to have this deep-seated love for each other that are very different. And love, I mean the brotherhood love. They are going to really rely on each other to get each other through this together. And that's Egan and Clevin. Yeah. And they couldn't be more different when you really think about it. They, they, they really are. And they, I think they do a good job. As we record this, we've only seen the, the first two episodes. Mm-hmm. But Jen's been reading the book. And, and so we've kind of making our way through it. We're looking forward to the next episode coming out. And you know, kind of one last thing that, that Jen wanted to stress before we kind of really dive into the show and the mm-hmm. characters was kind of the, you know, the, you know, you've acknowledged kind of your own bias here. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about that as a historian and I am a historian, academic historian. You have to acknowledge your bias. And my bias will definitely be on the side of these pilots because I know what it takes to go through this training. It's hard training. It's academic. It's fast paced. It's high level. And then you have to fly at high efficiency and be very good at it. And what they don't show is what it takes to make it through flight school and how many people actually wash out of flight school. Because you have to be both. You have to be good at knowing the aircraft and schematics and what an aircraft is doing, but you also have to fly the aircraft and be good at understanding aerodynamics. And so what you're going to see a lot of, and they've already stressed it in these first couple episodes, and we'll talk more about this, is the high learning curve that all of these men are going through. This type of bombing is new. This type of flying is new for them. This bomb site is new even though they've gotten very proficient of it in America, they're not proficient using it in Europe, different weather conditions. Even when you see Egan listen to Crosby, who's giving him details about how to fly back, he's, I, I suggest we go 244 and then turn south when we hit Scotland. And then you see Egan think about it. Let's do that. That's not what normally happens. Your plans are all done before you even leave. Right, but they're adjusting on the fly. They're adjusting on the fly. And yeah. you're going to see this. You're going to see the, this is unknown territory for these men. This is new. They're making it up as they go. So you're going to see error. You're going to see human error. And you're, so you're going to see me really feel for them and, and making their decisions in the cockpit and making them quickly under a lot of pressure. And because I know what that feels like, I'm going to be biased and really side with them and and forgive them a lot of their errors where there will be a lot of that probably happening. Yeah. And and I think that's good to acknowledge. So let's dive in. Let's dive into the show. So we've watched the first couple episodes. So why don't you kind of lay the groundwork for us and and for the audience about 
where we're at, kind of the general setting, and then let's let's just kind of dive in. So we're going to talk about the bloody 100th. So you have to think of the 8th Air Force. We've seen Band of Brothers. They're giving you the infantry of the Army. You've seen the Pacific. They're giving you the Marines. This is going to be the Army Air Corps. So we're getting the third chapter. And this is the 8th Air Force. This is the 100th Bomber Group, Bombardment Group. And it's made up of four squadrons, which the numbers are weird and crazy because I never understood how squadron numbers are made up anyway in the you military. Know it's kind of like a classic. It's a running joke on any military base <laughs> that two buildings that are next to each other, their numbers could be two and then 217. It's probably the same thing. So right? it, the numbering just doesn't really make sense. It doesn't. So the, the four squadrons that are part of the 100 that are there at Thorpe Abbott's airfield is 349, 350, 351, and 418. <laughs> so yeah. those are the four groups you're going to get. And you have Egan's in one, Clevin's in another. And so you're going to get them making up these four groups. Now, they're in um, Nor- Norfolk, England. And oh. we're in Norfolk, Virginia. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> so it's very interesting. It's about an hour and a half north of London. It's by Norwich. So they're they're kind of close to the, like a little city, but away from the big city. Yeah. And this is another kind of change you're going to see from like Band of Brothers or Pacific, you're going to see hot meals. You're going to see warm showers. You're going to see them being woken up from nice warm bunks. So this is a different type of warfare these air crew are fighting, right? Yeah, because they're 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 flying back. You know, those that make it back, they're flying back from their mission mm-hmm. to a spot that is well behind enemy lines. They're flying back to England, north of London. Yes. And these airfields, because there's hundreds of these airfields that basically were put up in London and surrounding areas, they're kind of squeezed into village areas. So what you also see is a lot of civilians that are kind of like on the airfield with them and kind of watching and, and farming as they're landing aircraft, which you don't get stateside here in America. Our airfields are, are bases. So the, they're, they're fenced off. Fenced off. Yeah. And so you're not going to see that here. So you're getting this understanding that this war fighting during World War II was very much immersed into the whole civilian lifestyle. Yeah. I mean, it was all hands on deck. You know, for In the Navy, that means everybody's fighting. Yeah. And so the local people built these places for them. So even if you visit Thorpe Abbott today, there's a real sense of community there. People are very protective of their history yeah. that these men came and did. So. There's a lot of camaraderie there. And I, there is a little kind of, the spoiler alert, there's a kind of little animosity scene between the British pilots and the American pilots. Yeah, that was episode one. And I think people have a little hard time with that because they're like, well, there really wasn't this kind of animosity. But you and I spoke about this and this Hollywoodies that gets done. Yeah. And we really believe that Spielberg doesn't just throw characters in for no reason. And there is going to be a moment where there's like a full circle. The hundredth is going to become the bloody hundredth. And these men are going to these British men yeah, are really going to appreciate. Uh, my my only guess is that those these these Brits are going to make a second appearance somewhere during the show. We haven't seen it yet. We haven't but. seen it yet. But so we kind of open up in the beginning of June, and so you have to think Thorpe Abbott flew its first mission June twenty fifth, and that's where gonna, they're going to lo- lose those three bombers. And that was forty four, forty three, forty three, forty three, and so they're going to fly their last mission in forty five. So. You got a 22 months here. Yeah. So in 22 months, you're going to see a lot. And I stress this to people. When America entered the war, we were like sixth in creating aircraft, making aircraft. We were sixth in, a, in military wise. By the end of the war, we're number one. Yeah. We're going to be rolling off aircraft like crazy. We're going to, the whole country comes together and starts building. And when they're losing these aircraft, they're replacing these aircraft. And the 17 is the third most built bomber, but the 24, the Liberator, is going to be the first most built bomber. So you can imagine they're just turning out these aircraft. The 17 that you see on there in the in the show, it's pretty authentic. It's hard because it's not a lot of 17s that fly yeah, now. B-17s. B-17s. So it's CGI'd. But remember, this is, I think it's before they got the chin turret on the front. 
but it's called the Flying Fortress because the first time somebody looked at it and saw all these guns, they're like, wow, that's a Flying Fortress. And that's how it got its nickname. It has the ball turret underneath. It has what they call a square D. So they have a D on the tail that's painted with a white square behind it. Oh, okay. And that's the hundredth. So when you see the square D on the tail. And each bomber has 10 people on it. So when you start to have these losses of aircraft, that's something that is very different than you're going to see at Band of Brothers and Well, and I was thinking Pacific. about I was thinking about the 10 people in this aircraft because I think it's about the same amount of people in a B29. Mm-hmm. B-29 is much, much, much bigger, bigger aircraft, mm-hmm. pressurized, ca- you know, cabin and all that stuff. We are Masters of the Air video. We have a Master of the Air video where we go to the National Air and Space Museum, mm-hmm. um, as well as Arlington National Cemetery and visit some of these real uh, Masters, of the, real masters mm-hmm. of the Air. And they have the fuselage of a B-17 there. And I'm thinking, you're walking next to it, and it's not like it's towering over you. Ten men in this aircraft... I mean, a lot of them are just kind of, they, they can't stand up all the way. It's, that's, a, that's 10 men in this aircraft. That's a lot. That's a lot. For the, for the size of, of the aircraft. It's, you you kind of have to, if you ever get a chance to be in the D.C. area and you go to National Air and Space Museum, try to go see that. It's right now, it's off kind of in the back. Yeah. I have a feeling once this show gets more popular, it will kind of, it might be brought out. So I want to stress some things because, again, I my heart, belongs to the air crew and the people who are on this aircraft and the people who are keeping this aircraft flying. 10 men in this aircraft, most of them are not going to wear seatbelts. Most of them might be strapped into their gun, the ball turret guy, but other people are doing two or three jobs. Navigator is not only navigating, he's working a gun. They're in freezing temperatures. And I'm not joking, negative 60, negative 40, (sighs) negative 20 degrees. It's an unpressurized cabin. So what does that mean? It means they have to be on oxygen and there's no heat. There's no air conditioning. Because the, the air's thinner. The air's thinner up there, no. which means you can go faster. But it's also colder. But it's also colder. A lot colder. And there's no oxygen. So you have to wear the oxygen mask. Anytime you're above 10,000 feet. Now, as a helicopter pilot, we stayed below. But anytime you go above 10,000 feet, you have to put on oxygen or you become hypoxic. So hypoxia is where there's not enough oxygen molecules and you basically just suffocate your brain. Yeah. You don't you, realize you, it's you'll happening. Pass out, yeah. mm-hmm. And that's why you have to catch your own hypoxia. You don't realize it's ha- you you don't. You get kind of euphoric. So they they said filming this Masters of the Air, that was the hardest part to portray drama. Because most of this drama is gonna happen above ten thousand feet. Most right. of this drama is gonna all, happen. They all have to wear masks. Masks. So you won't realistic. see them talk. It's hard to see inflection, it's hard to see dr- dramatization of their their, their lines, facial, facial, facial expression, expression. Yeah. So all you see is eyes. So you'll see a lot of interaction happen below 10,000 feet. That's why you see Crosby grow up and stuff, get air sick. And he actually said, Crosby said, once he put the oxygen on, he was fine. Mm. And and they're really not below 10,000 feet for very long, but they do it for the show sure. so they can have more of that interaction and talking. But these air crew are wearing these flight jackets. And we get these flight jackets now more ceremonial. I did wear mine over the Rocky Mountains in a T-34 that's unpressurized because I was freezing my butt off over the Rocky Mountains. But that's where the flight jacket comes from because it actually was a purposeful gear you were issued. Yeah, I mean, that's why they have that's where they have the, the thick collars yeah. and all the stuff. And we still have some remnants of a thick collar, but they were much thicker yeah. then. And they had the pants and they had a heated suit Underneath kind of like an electric blanket they would wear that you could plug in. Oh, wow. Now, this is 1940s electric technology, so those didn't always work so great. But but this is where you get the issue of men peeing because they don't have access to a toilet, and then it's freezing, and then they're getting frostbite. Yeah. That's where that's coming from. And so this crew on an aircraft, these hours are like four-hour missions Three hours of nothing, one hour of complete chaos. And so even when they're flying back with injured people, it's usually an hour to get back. And everybody has to be their own medic. So if someone's hurt, another person's coming off a gun or coming off of something to help somebody. And you're going to see, this is what I think you're going to see a lot more of as it progresses, as these crews are going to get tighter and they're going to overcome a lot of their differences because of what you have to do to get through a mission when it's just 10 of you. Also, 
if something happens to your aircraft, the 10 of you go down together. And that's why you lose 10 at a time. That's what's different about the Pacific and Band of Brothers is there's no cover. If something happens, that's it. You yeah. go, you're yeah. all going. You go down or the airplane explodes. I mean, that's, and, yeah. and they have parachutes and they have life preservers. But I want to remind everybody, these men did not go to jump school. Now, in a helicopter, you yeah. got nothing. <laughs> you're, you're, not, you're not wearing a parachute in a helicopter. You're not wearing a parachute in a helicopter. You're going down with the aircraft. You're going down, you're going down with the yeah. aircraft. So I know kind of what that feels like. But I have flown an aircraft where you are strapped into the parachute. Usually they're strapped into your ejection seat or the seat you're in. But the T-34 was a bailout where you had to open the cockpit, get on the wing and bail out. So I went to school before you did that. They prepared you for it. These men were not prepared for that. So if there was an instance where they are going to bail out. They're, that's, they're learning on the fly. Yeah. It, this is, here we go. I'm going to pull this chute. I hope it opens and it's the best I can do because I never got trained in this. And this is probably one of my biggest problems with this uh, depiction, this Hollywood depiction of yeah. this, because this is true as well, is when Egan first goes through the flak field. Flak is where they fire up metal that hits you and it just disperses. It could hit you like 100 miles an hour. So you don't know. It's little pieces of metal. Yeah, it's basically like a anti-aircraft shotgun. Yeah. And you don't know where it's going to hit. And so flak fields, people just flew through them. One of the hardest things for pilots to do because you can't do anything for flak. Yeah. You can't just have to, fight back. You just have to hope. For flak. Yeah. You just, it, that's what a wing and a prayer comes from. With flak, you just go. And so when Egan first flies through the flak field and they make it back and the other pilot says to him, don't tell them, they'll figure it out. I think it's the worst thing you can do. Yeah, that, that was that was an interesting kind of mentorship that, that they gave, that someone more senior gave to Egan before. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was even Clevin's response at the end of that episode, why didn't you tell me? Yeah. So I think what they're getting into there is this, these men weren't trained for this because there was no way to train for this. And this is where my loyalty comes to these guys is as a pilot, you realize everything you learn, everything you train on is written in blood. Someone has learned from this and done this and more than likely died from it. And so you learned the emergency procedure or how to survive something like this. Yeah. Well, in aviation, mistakes are fatal <laughs> and you learn from your mistakes. And so if you've learned from someone else's mistakes, you've learned from someone else's fatality. Exactly. It's why they say NATOPS is, is, is written, written blood. blood. Mm -hmm. So and NATOPS is kind of the, the Navy's aviation Bible. Aviation like Bible yeah. that we carry on our, and that's why our, our emergency procedures are all learned because someone else has learned what to do to save themselves. But I think you always prepare someone by telling them what to expect because what you're doing as a pilot is you're aviate, navigate, communicate. And if you can't even do that because you're ex experiencing something you've never seen before, it's hard to do your job. So if someone can at least prepare you, hey, they're going to fire this flak up at you. It's going to be metal. There's nothing you can do. Be prepared for not being able to do anything. Now, I I'm not sure if you would look this up ahead of time, but I know you've You've talked you know, every now and then about going to SEER school. Yeah. So they search, evade. Uh, rescue and escape. Rescue and escape. So POW kind of, they, camp. They, yeah, POW. They, they train pilots kind of how, if they go down behind enemy lines, how to basically escape and or survive. if they get caught, mm -hmm. how to be a POW. Did they train this before, during World War II or was this kind of a lesson learned after? This was, again... It's all baptism by fire, right? That's kind of what I think episode one and two is really showing you at baptism by fire. Yeah. POW Sears School comes out of Vietnam. Okay. All right. So that's, right? that's where it came from. It comes out of Vietnam. So everything we learn because yeah, we pilots- learned, We learned from the from World War II in Vietnam. Because pilots who were captured during Vietnam yep. didn't know how to take the being captured and, yeah. and being tortured. Yeah. And so they teach us now how to do that. Yeah. Which is what I think- you always tell. If you learn something, you always tell. We call it the gouge. In flight school, you learn something. You learn something that they're going to ask. You learned a little yeah. piece of information. Give me the gouge. You always give the gouge. I think that's probably why I was, I was first in my class out of flight school, as I always gave the gouge. If yeah. I learned gouge, I would tell you. So if I'm learning something on a flight... I'm going to come back and be like, this is what happened. Yeah. Be prepared for this because it, it just allows you to have a mental preparedness, which I think as pilots is the biggest thing you need. 
So as far as the the TV show okay. so far is, is concerned, I mean, how are they doing with as far as the characters and their accuracy there? I know you've been kind of hunting down some other interviews and stuff like that about why they kind of focused so much on some of the aviation scenes that they showed. Sure. I want to stress they, they so focus on the 100th because of its reputation as the bloody 100th. Yeah. Although statistically, it's not going to be more losses than any other air crew. Every other, if you joined the 8th, it's a 50% chance. Yeah. So that's going to be the same. It's just that these a couple missions that the 100th had, they had catastrophic losses. There's going to be some missions that come back unscathed. But a couple missions, they're going to have just one aircraft come back. Cute. And you're going to learn there's a couple things that kind of add to this. And again, baptisms by fire, things are written in blood, formation flying, bombing. So let's talk they, a little bit about they, formation and they, flying. And they actually stress that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So when you fly in formation, it is safer as a group because it's just like anything else, the safety in numbers, right? But where you end up in formation can make you much more vulnerable. And they talk about that. So there were times when the hundredth would be a part of a group and they would get, uh, I think it's called Purple Heart Corner, where they would be at the back corner of a formation. So when the, the Luftwaffe would come, that's what they call the, milit the German Air Force. Fighters, yeah. That's, they pick off the back left and they work their way in. And so you knew if you were sitting in that part of the formation, you're easy pickings. Yeah, so and it, it, it was interesting because they'd be kind of in... in I'll call it the ready room. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the pilots would be getting their briefings and the colonel would be up front saying, okay, we're going on this mission. This is where we're going. And this is the spot we have. And you would either see them just completely dejected. Oh no, this is, this is, we do not want to be there. Or just overly joyous <laughs> saying, yeah, but they're basically out in front. They're going to be the ones dropping the bomb and, and they're not going to be picked off from the back. Yes. So for, for, I love formation flying. It's my favorite flying to do. And the closer you are tucked into somebody, the the more fun it is. But it's also dangerous because thank God B-17s are dual piloted because if you are flying formation, you really do not take your eyes off the aircraft because you're tucked into them. Now, they're not quite as close, but they are pretty tight. But you can't take your eyes off them because as you see, you could fly into them. All it takes through, is just a clouds, second to glance yeah. away and you could tilt into another aircraft, hit another aircraft because you're so close. So one pilot's looking at the controls, making sure you're not losing air pressure or gas or fuel or is leaking and the other pilot's staying in formation. Now, as they start to fire, as the they engage uh, the German attacker fighters and they engage and they start to fire their machine guns, people ask, well, do they hit each other by mistake? Now they fire a stream of bullets yeah. and they're so close in formation. The answer is yes. So I always tell people situational, situational awareness is the most effective thing in combat and usually the first thing to leave. Yeah. And you don't realize it. You're engaging the enemy and you're firing and then all of a sudden you're firing right to the aircraft right beside you. So the friendly fire did happen. Bombs were dropped on our own aircraft. Oh, wow. By our own aircraft. Again, I give these air crew big leeway because this is so much an experiment. These men are learning this. This is new. So Well, and and you if you ever talk to someone that's been through a combat situation. So there's 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 I, I've there's people that I've I've worked with or worked with out that have done deployments to Afghanistan and stuff like that. And I, I heard someone talk about one time a situation where, you know, they go through all this training, they're doing convoys and this, that, and the other. And this, this chief gets out of, of a Humvee because they're stopping because they thought they saw an IED. Mm -hmm. And then they, you know, someone starts approaching their convoy. And my chief said his, uh, he got so amped up and so locked in, like he almost shot this guy. Mm-hmm. Because uh, he couldn't hear anything. This is this is him telling. He couldn't hear anything. All he saw was this person, and he almost pulled the trigger. And luckily, his buddies were there. No, 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 he's a friendly. And so I can only imagine flying through the air over Nazi Germany, and all of a sudden you've got enemy aircraft attacking you. The same exact thing's going to happen. You get locked in trying to shoot that aircraft to protect your own, 
And the, like you said, the first thing that goes away is that situational awareness yeah. and, and the unfortunate happen. The commanding officer that you see, um, Harding, was a big drinker. He encouraged his men to drink. So you see that a little bit of that. And Egan yeah. is a big drinker. And this is how men will deal with this kind of stress. Yeah. And he encouraged it. He encouraged them to fight. You see the fighting. This is all from real life because this helps you alleviate that stress. And the next day, because you're doing it all again, and it, and you don't know who's coming back every time. Yeah. And there would be months where you'd have no casualties and then all of a sudden you'd lose 50% of everybody. Ugh. So superstitions are big and they show a lot of that uh, in the first couple episodes with the salt. Yep. With, which, uh, is fun, which is also funny. It was funny. I love that Clevin took the card. Even though Egan's, this is my lucky card, take the card and Clevin's no. But you see Clevin eventually take the card. I'll tell you why. Because every pilot is superstitious. Yeah. I don't care who you are. We do believe that there is... It's, a, everybody's got their own thing. It's a, We believe it's a bit of luck and a bit of skill. There is luck. Again, where you end up in formation, if the fighters come out that day, if they don't come out that day, if you have good weather, if you don't have good weather, and then the skill of the pilot when it's needed, yeah. it really is a bit of both. And I also want to stress, you're not flying with the same crews all the time. Yeah. And I think that's a good thing to remember because a lot of people think, and you, we talked about this in our mm -hmm. Arlington video about Master of the Air at Arlington, about how a lot of people will assume that the same pilots are flying with the aircraft because of the nose art and they mm -hmm. painted it and this, that, and the other. And that is absolutely not the case. No, because you got to think people are getting injured. People are getting what they call, they have PTSD. I think they call it flak fire or something where they give them a little break. Yeah. And same thing with aircraft. Aircraft would get damaged aircraft and would be would go down, down for, a while. for a while. And so you would do a hodgepodge crew. And you almost see that with Crosby being pulled in as navigator because the navigator's sick. And you're flying with different people all the time. So you have to really learn this camaraderie with everybody. Yeah. You kind of build this camaraderie with everybody, everyone. And Crosby, I really appreciate, He, I think he writes a book. I think he wrote Wing and a Prayer. But he talks about how that first mission how he's, let's fly this, 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 and this. And then as he's flying back, he forgets to make radio calls about the change that they made. And they land and he's given an award. He thinks he's going to be court-martialed because he didn't tell them that he changed the plan. Yeah. And they give him an award because they think he didn't make radio calls for radio silence, oh, that's which right. kept it's the fighters from coming. And it's, it's safe. Right? They only lost three planes. Everybody but it's made, really just because he forgot. Really because he forgot. And again, all this baptism by fire, sometimes it's luck. Yeah. So then you learn, oh, maybe I shouldn't make radio calls. Maybe we'll learn yeah. that. Now, on, on the other side, mm -hmm. one of the things that you actually appreciated was some of the pre-flight scenes. Yes. So I love the checklist. Yeah. I loved that scene. And it, and they, I think, was it you, we had either seen a video or you were listening to a, a, another podcast that they intentionally put those check for those checklist scenes in there. I, I listened to Tom Hanks talk about it. So Tom Hanks loves the B-17. I mean, he's he, executive producer of Master of the Air. He wanted to stress how just measured pilots are and how we are so rigorous with rules and regulation. And we do those checklists every time, every step. You do not skip a step. You do not half asset, you're going to do the whole thing. And I think it builds trust because you're doing it together and you're zeroing things out and you're setting things up and you're getting ready. And it just shows how attention to detail you both are and you're not going to skip anything. Well, and it's the same for the rest of the crew. And every crew is doing it. Mm -hmm. It is a normal thing. And that's because you're not flying with the same crew. So you do it every time in every aircraft. You have your checklist. It's usually on your knee board, which is a, a board you strap to your leg. And you go through it. And he showed explicitly in that scene, each cockpit was doing it. And they, he showed a different part of the checklist as each cockpit's going through it. They're all doing the same one. They're all doing the same one. They're yeah. all doing it the same way. And I just really appreciate that. As a pilot, you're going to do a pre-takeoff checklist, a takeoff checklist, an after-takeoff checklist. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, and for, for those watching the video, Jen had secretly watched the two episodes the night before. <laughs> 
and then told me in the morning, hey, it came out Thursday night. I watched it. I'll watch it with you again tonight. And then when we're going through the checklist scene, I've never seen her so happy. She's checklist, checklist. She's so excited about these checklists because it is such an important part of what, what pilots do. And that piece of it right there, it was was so realistic and kind of, again, showing that true pilot nature and, and what the crews do and, and all the steps that it takes every single time they're taking off. Every they're not just jumping time. in and cowboying off the runway every single time. And if something fails on that checklist and the if aircraft can't fly, okay, we're going to get out. We're going to go to the next one. Mm-hmm. And I want people to know, we know every switch, every circuit breaker, every instrument on that panel. Every single, I know what everyone does. I know what electrical source it's connected to. I know what it's showing you. I know if I lose power, what I'm going to keep, what I'm going to lose. I know if a circuit breaker gets unset, if I can reset it, if I can't. I know everything about that panel of every aircraft I have ever flown in. It's not just the one you're assigned to. It's every aircraft you fly in, you know everything about it. That's why pilots are not dumb. I tell people all the time, we're not, it is like cowboy. It is a little bit of that, but you also have to be pretty smart. Well, and, and just like you said earlier, right, there's there's kind of two people, overly confident slash cocky <laughs> people you want in your life. That's a pilot and your surgeon. And both require incredible intelligence, following procedure, mm-hmm. and and knowing this stuff blind, but also following those checklists. I mean, I'm I'm not a doctor. I don't know too many that are surgeons, but I'm sure they have their own checklist that they do every time when they're prepping a patient or doing mm-hmm. everything, all that stuff before they cut somebody open. Similar kind of thing. So Bloody 100th gets its its name, let's say. One character we haven't seen yet, you're going to see Rosie Rosenthal. Uh, he's going to be in this. He, he's a big part of Masters of the Air. Yes, you were talking about him. Rosie Rosenthal is considered the old man because he's 25. Oh my gosh. <laughs> to a military college. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, it was 19, 20. And I remember there was, we had someone who had been in the Navy for a few years before he came to the Naval Academy. He was 25 years old, and we call him the old man. So I've I've absolutely I've absolutely been there, but now it makes me roll my eyes and wish I was 25 again. I know. So Rosie Rosenthal is a lawyer. Uh, he's Jewish, so for the him, this is you know means a lot. And he comes there, and he's amazing pilot. He does two combat tours. He doesn't have to fly as many missions as he does. He, I think at first you had to do 25 before you got sent home. But then it changed, they changed it to 35. He ended up doing 50. Yeah. But he survived them all. And being a lawyer, he's part of the Nuremberg trials. And he's going to actually, I think he interviews the second in command of the Nazi party. Oh, wow. So after Hitler commits suicide, he's the next guy who's interrogated during the Nuremberg trials. And he's in, he's in charge of the Luftwaffe. The Rosie Rosenthal is interviewing the man who's responsible for killing his fellow air crewmen, his fellow pilots, and who tried to kill him. And he's part of the whole, his execution, and and he follows through with all of it. And Man. he's just a very unassuming guy, and you're going to see, he's definitely going to be a character in Masters of the Air. Yeah, that, I, people like that just absolutely blow my mind. And and usually those people, if you ever meet someone like that, are the most kind of just understated, you would never know it by just passing them on the subway or, or whatever. August 17th of 1943, we haven't gotten to this mission yet, but we'll see it. Regensburg, they have a, they're flying in formation. They're flying in that Purple Heart corner, mm-hmm. like we talked about before. Of 22 planes that go up of the hunt, they, they lose nine. So they have a 40% loss. But the big one is October 10th, 1943. It's a Munster raid. They're, I think they're dropping bombs on a worker camp. So Think about war economics. That's yeah. what they're, they're trying to hit centers of gravity. Targets on. They're they're hitting steel mills. They're hitting gasoline. They're hitting oil rigs. They're hitting they're hitting places to kill the war economics, which yeah. they eventually do yeah. in Germany. We'll talk more about how the technology is going to shift here from the Germans being the better pilots with the better aircraft to the Americans being the better pilots with the better aircraft. But they're going to launch thirteen planes. Only one will make it back, and that will be Rosie Rosenthal's plane. That's nice. where they get the reputation of the Bloody 100th. That's ab- absolutely wild. Mm-hmm. Absolutely wild. I-, I can't even, 
He's going to land after losing two engines. He's going to lose his intercom system and they're going to lose their supplemental oxygen and he still gets the plane back. I know. He's badass. This is what we're going to see depicted. Yeah. This is what this drama sensation is going to show. And so it's different than Band of Brothers. It's different than the Pacific. You're going to see this a massive loss in a short period of time. And that's the gut punch of being an aviator. And you and I know you can see someone in the hallway one day and then lose them the next. Yeah. And when it happens to 50% or the guys you've been hanging out, all the guys you've been hanging out with for the last couple months, this is why they have this amazing reputation. The reason why this book exists and Masters Air is about them is because they have more documentation than any other bomber group. Okay. And when Ronald Miller was teaching at Oxford, he had gone over to Thorpe Abbott's and they had so much stories and they had captured so much of people's interactions and yeah. he found this really great relationship between Egan and Clevin yeah. and he was able to pull so much accuracy from That's these cool. stories that he could write this. So saving all of that is also important. Saving these stories yeah. is also important. So I just wanted to stress that as well. But you're going to get these colorful personalities. You're going to get the survivalism of surviving things like this. Sure. And what it takes and how people do it. Medicate with alcohol. Yeah. Fighting. They, they don't know. They didn't know that what we know now. Exactly. Another myth that's kind of created. I don't know if they're going to show it in this because people don't know if it's exactly accurate. But the 418, there's a Captain Knox where the Luftwaffe have basically taken over the plane and they want to capture the plane. And to kind of surrender, you would drop your gear. And so they're, they're, he's dropped his gear and they're taking him into a, a landing field. And he ends up, right before he lands, shooting. He has them shoot both the planes and then raises his gear and flies and back. And takes off. Yes. And so they claim that the Luftwaffe now has a vendetta against the square D. Oh, they're, they're looking for the square they're D. They're looking for the bloody 100th. No one knows if that's exactly what happened. Yeah. If maybe some claim he had lost an engine, so he had surrendered, but then got the engine back. Oh, and then knew. and then was like, we're like just, all right, here we go. Let's yeah, right? buckle up, boys. But people don't also think that the Luftwaffe are like had it out for one. Sure. Beast. Like they're not going to waste their time to fly to these B-17s when they can pick up yeah. these B-17s that are closer. Sure. So it just might be a lot of myth and folklore, which you get a lot of in aviation anyway. Sure. Aviators, <laughs> aviators stories, they get better every time. And there's a reason for that, right? They start off here and they end up way over here. So one thing I will say that's kind of funny is you see him bring the dog on yeah. the plane. Yeah. So at one point, this is true. <laughs> They're in Africa and they somehow get like this little donkey on to the, just another of, aviator. Of thing. course they do. <laughs> Aviators do stupid things. <laughs> and so they get this and they bring the little donkey back to England and oh they have it on the base for a while. <laughs> it's just show up bringing back a donkey. But I do want to, I wanted to say that it is a, a really good quote here. The 100th Bomber Group Major John Bennett, he summed it up as what the 100 lacks in luck, it makes up for in courage. The men of the century have fighting hearts. And they were called the men of the century because of the 100th. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's I awesome. really love that. There is a lot more. They're wearing their, their survival vests and their parachutes. We still wear life vests when we fly. That stuff has all kind of just been innovated, but we still wear it. And parachutes. They usually are, like I said, in the ejection seats. And if you do bail out, sometimes SEALs wear them before they bail out, but you're not bailing out in a helicopter, so yeah. we don't have them. Yeah. But a lot of the stuff that they have and they're wearing has just evolved. And we still do the same things today. We still have the same things today. Things are, like I said, born in blood, but we still have the flight jacket. We still have a lot of things that are born of aviation that we still follow through because we are very much about tradition. Yeah. And loyalty. And you know, once a pilot, always a pilot. There is a camaraderie with us. And I just I just really appreciate watching this. I do love it. I see people's 
criticisms online. And I do know that there is some historical accuracies that aren't there. But as far as I'm concerned, I love seeing. Yeah. And we would love to hear from you guys watching this video and kind of what you thought of the show, any experience you may have, whether you're an aviator yourself or kind of just what you thought of this compared to Band of Brothers or your favorite character, your favorite lines. But we, we want to hear from you guys because we, we've had other videos that are growing in popularity and, and we love having these conversations. Sure. And as we close, I just want to touch on one last thing. Sure. Nose art. Yes. <laughs> yes. So uh-huh. if you know me, I love nose art. And we actually have an episode coming out tomorrow yep. on nose art because I, I love it so much. And... I appreciate, again, what these men are going through and what it takes to re-inspire yourself to get out there every day and the superstition that kind of comes with it. So there's there's aircraft names that are famous, like Nola Gay and Memphis Bell. Right? And the Memphis Bell was the girlfriend of the pilot and she was from Memphis, so he painted her on board. Their names are like Lady Luck. You saw Alice from Dallas in the episode, uh, Boss Lady. Denver Doll, Liberty Bell, Pickle Puss, which I love. <laughs> but there's one really famous one, and I, I want Scott to put the picture on here, Mason and Dixon. And it is full on. Yeah. <laughs> and it's named after the pilot Floyd, Floyd Mason and the navigator William Dixon. And it's a Ranchai semi-nude painted by Sergeant Frank Stevens of the 351st. And... I just love that this is what it took them to really get behind each other and believe in them, believe in themselves, believe in their aircraft. And it's also an ode to the air crew. Well, and and one of the things I think you said in in the nose art video, that's if you're watching this, that video has already been released. But you said that the the nose art gets more risque, (laughs) the further away that these squadrons are basically from wherever the the main DC is. So the further they are away, the more risque they get. And the closer you are to death. I sure. think. And like I said, the commanding officer kind of encourages drinking. Yeah. And I think he probably encouraged whatever it takes to make you laugh, to bring a smile on your face, to make you believe. I, I think he probably really encouraged in them. So it's just really something that I, I love nose art because of what it means and what it means to these men and the history of it. So I just wanted to talk about that as well. Yeah, it's a ton of fun. We're enjoying the show. And again, we want to hear from you guys. So if you guys have anything else you kind of want to contribute or or, or talk about in the comments, please let us know. Uh, we, we want to hear from you. Oh, one last thing. Jude Law's son is that air crewman. Oh, is he the... That's the head like air the crew crewman. chief? Yeah. Oh, That's why he's so okay. cute. Yeah, and good looking. yeah. That's Jude yeah. Law's son. So I love an air crewman, the, the crew chief who's in charge of the aircraft that's his aircraft yes and they they actually talk very specifically about crew chiefs and kind of give them a lot of props on the show as a pilot that's not your aircraft it's his aircraft or her aircraft and they treat that like their baby they take care of it they make sure everything is great before you go up and it's just a real team spirit when you're you're taking care of an aircraft in the military so i i really appreciate that yeah that's cool good for him Well, folks, we've just landed back on terra firma after a thrilling tour through the skies of World War II with Masters of the Air. I hope you enjoyed exploring the show's portrayal of B-17 missions with us, separating the Hollywood dogfights from the bone-chilling reality of those young American bomber crews. Remember, this wasn't just about historical accuracy. It was about getting inside the heads of these guys, understanding the why behind their actions in the face of unimaginable danger. We explored their moral quandaries, the pilots' lightning fast decisions, and the navigators' unwavering focus amidst flak bursts and fighter attacks. And what did we learn? That these masters of the air weren't just daredevils and flying machines, they were strategists, psychologists, and sometimes reluctant warriors, all bound together by a shared mission and a brotherhood forged in the crucible of combat. We also remember the camaraderie, the humor that kept them sane, and the sheer awe of soaring through the clouds towards a distant target. We explored the bond between crewmates, the trust they placed in each other's skills and courage, knowing that one misstep could doom them all. 
Masters of the Air may not be a perfect historical document, but it captured the essence of what it meant to be a B-17 crewman. It reminded us of the extraordinary sacrifices made by these ordinary men, their bravery etched in the skies over Nazi Germany. So as the engines cool down and the landing gear retracts, let's carry that memory with us. Let's remember the roar of the engines, the sting of the cold, and the unyielding courage of those who dared to be masters of the air. Thank you for listening to Talk With History Podcast, and please reach out to us at talkwithhistory.com. More importantly, if you know someone else that may enjoy this episode or that loves Masters of the Air as much as we do, please share it with them. We rely on you, our community, to grow, and we appreciate you all every day. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you.